welcome Professor Ian Phillips, please. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, it says on there that I retired in 2016. I've got all this grey hair. Of course, one of the things that immediately strikes you is what can I possibly be telling you? Because you're the, uh, the young brains who are coming along and I have now become an old man. Uh, before I retired, I worked for this company called Arm, which a lot of you will have heard of, but if you've got any smart electronic products in your pocket today, in your car, in your home, then they're probably Arm powered. And it was, Arm is a little company that sprung out of Cambridge in the UK and was based there, and I worked there for the last 18 years as principal staff engineer. During that time, I reported straight into the board. Now, this is interesting. This is one of the world's leading companies. It's in the UK and I was reporting into the top level of that company. And inter Interestingly, to give you some idea, this company was sold to, to SoftBank in 2016 for £24 billion, real cash. It had 4,000 employees, that's all. Carillion, you've probably heard of in the news of recent, uh, recent weeks, it has a stock market valuation of £1 billion prior to its financial troubles and it employed 40,000 people. Now, it's interesting there that this is a very different company. This company is a high-tech company. It's a, it's a front-end company leading technology. And right up there was this old grey guy, okay? You might legitimately ask, what was it that I was doing that was so valuable and how did I get there and that's what I want to try and pass over to you for a moment because the technology when I came out of school was very different from what it is today but I don't think you appreciate because it's all too easy to assume that everything that's around you has always been like that I don't think you probably appreciate how much things have actually changed so I want to tell you about that now I guess you all want to be engineers or maybe you want to be scientists and that's your plan. It's very useful to actually know what an engineer is and the top lines are the only ones that I, I ask you to remember. Engineers make stuff. They make stuff. They don't think about it. They don't theorize about it. Well, they do a bit of that, but at the end of the day, they are measured by the success in making stuff. Scientists, if you have aspirations for being a researcher, which are all quite legitimate, they essentially work in the area of unknown. They're in the discovery business. Their products are something which are discover, discover and quantify. And then you have this group called technicians. Technicians we mustn't undervalue, mustn't underestimate. These guys and girls are very often very skilled at using equipment and methods and machines but essentially they mend and they operate. They are very good at, the, at doing that and frequently you will find that technicians who are working for you are capable of doing things which seem to be much better than you're able to do it. It's really just a case of saying they're very good at using their hands in a certain category. Scientists are very good at using their brains in a certain, ca certain category and engineers are good at combining technology with product requirements and delivering. So these are different roles and very important. But I'm not going to dwell too much on those, but you might like to look at it at later time. And the other thing, of course, you need to know is what is electronics. Now, most of us have this idea that electronics is a fairly recent thing. Um, I guess you don't think about it too much, but it's a, it was a bit of a surprise to me to find out that uh, really what I, what I would define as the electronic amplifier as the kickoff of this is 180 years old, the relay. So the first electronic products that were coming out were coming out 180 years ago. This is a, a very, you think, relay. I know what a relay is. It's not that complicated. It may not be that complicated, but people tried to make computers with them and they tried to build all sorts of systems with them and lots of which worked. The original telegraph systems, for example, were all based on relays. 
A magnetic amplifier, most of you will have no idea what that is, and yet as a technique, is a technique which is still in use today. And of course, valves, even so 110 years old, um, valves are still in use today in, in some very specialist areas, but for quite a long time were the, pre, the, the carrying vehicle for electronics. So think about that for the moment, that these technologies, which are that old, are still in use today in certain areas, even though we don't think of them as fundamental technologies for electronics anymore. Now, 1947, and you'll wonder, you might wonder a bit why I'm talking about some of these dates, but some of them have relationships which will become clear to you in a moment. Uh, so I'm going to l miss a whole lot of things, but I am going to talk about the first thought program computer, because this is baby, and it was produced in Manchester University. It's a proof of concept. Nobody seriously thought that this was going to be something which was going to be in their, in their homes, in their pockets, or even in their companies when it was created. It was really just a proof of concept that you could actually make a machine which solved problems electronically from a, from a program which was held externally to it. Um, and the, uh, the concept then, interestingly, as you'll see on there, was proven using valves. They had an awful lot of valves in that, and every day when you turned it on, because you certainly didn't leave it on overnight, uh, every day when you turned it on, one of the technicians who operated it had to find out which valves had died overnight and replace them. Because electronics wasn't always as reliable as we think of it, but nevertheless it was the only technology which was capable of doing this, and at that time people were thinking about how they might make computers. There was mechanical computers before this, and some of my other lectures have talked about that, but uh, we're not going to go there today. 1947, however, was the first, so that's the same date as the proof of concept compu computer, was the time when uh, Bardeen and Britain, and Shockley, of course, invented the transistor. So this is the first ever transistor, again, as a concept. Nobody seriously thought that that was going to go into volume production. Nobody seriously thought that that was going to be the technology which enabled the smartphones and cameras and TVs and uh, automatic driving vehicles. Nobody thought about that. They were just thinking of the concept of the transistor action. 1947. It took them four years to commercialize that transistor as a concept. It moved to this construction, which you, some of you will be uh, familiar with as a concept. It was called double diffused transistor, where you took a, a slice of, of n-type germanium, stuck two blobs of indium on the side of it, and then warmed it all up a little bit until it almost melted. And the problem was there was a, there's a gap between the emitter and collector, so it's a bipolar transistor, and all too often they shorted. So this was a transistor which was made one at a time. It was still a production item. If you look at that, you can see that that diagram and that architecture of implementation is the same. 1951. Now we come to the thing that happened around that time. That's when I was born. 1949 I was born. And uh, interesting thing here, that's the first picture of me one and a half years later. I haven't got any pictures of me when I was a baby. We've only got one picture of me at one and a half. The next picture of me is three. Can you imagine only having so few pictures in your, in your life today? You just, you'd have hundreds of pictures of, of, of the newborn baby. And it's only in black and white. We didn't have color. And the world back then wasn't actually black and white. There was color in it. It's just that the cameras weren't up to it. And back then, incidentally, my dad wasn't a sailor. He was a bus driver. Uh, back then, bus drivers had uniforms, and they were very smart. So I was born between the transistor being invented and the transistor being commercialized. But back in 1957, so we're still hovering around that area, the planar transistor was conceived by Jean Honey. Um, and it doesn't look all that exciting, does it, really? I mean, today, the vast majority of the transistors that we see in integrated circuits are certainly planar, meaning all the connections are at the top. One thing it did was it radically changed the way you make transistors because you don't make them one at a time anymore. You make them at a wafer scale, lots of them, and then you scribe the wafer. This wasn't done before. 
So it meant that the transistor implementation architecture was changed, but it also meant that the concept of making an integrated circuit appeared on the horizon. 1958, that makes me nine by that time. <coughs> the first commercial integrated circuit. This is moving fast, and I want you to think about this as moving fast, because this train is moving despite me. This thing is already crunching forward at a phenomenal rate. This is the first integrated circuit. That's how big it is in reality. Do you know the first time I saw an integrated circuit when you peered under a, mic under a lens, a magnifying glass at it, you could see that. You could see the transistors. You could work out what the circuit was. You didn't need a circuit diagram. You didn't need a CAD suite. You didn't need a C compiler or debugger or anything else like that because you, that was all you were designing. It was a little flip-flop and that's all it was. Four transistors, two resistors, and you could draw that circuit yourself. <coughs> that's the input, that's the output, and the rest of it is guesswork, okay? <coughs> now, that was a, the first integrated circuit and Robert Noyce actually founded Fairchild Semiconductors to make it. And they sold for $120 a piece. Now, that was back in 1961. So you must have been talking in, uh, in real terms today of about $1,000 for one of those things. People used them, however. They bought as many of them as they could get. So it was against this kind of background that Moore's Law was coined, 1965. So 1965... That previous uh, diagram was 1961. So 1965, Gordon Moore had observed, and he'd been designing integrated circuits with, 40, with 80 components, and he'd been designing them with 30 to 40 components in the previous generations, and he simply observed that the quantity of active devices that you were able to put down was doubling pretty damn fast. And he estimated that by 1975, you'd be looking at 65,000 transistors on an integrated circuit. But he was only talking about 80 on what he was designing at the time. What does 80 components look like? That's what 80 components looks like. One 74 series TTL logic device. <coughs> That's the circuit. That's the EDA. You don't need a lot of calculation to make something like that work. And it's only a two input NAND gate. So you design that circuit externally. As far as designing that chip is concerned, you didn't need any more sophisticated things than that. When you drew the transistors on the silicon, you were pretty well drawing all of the pieces of uh, active, all of the metal, all of the, act, uh, all of the diffusions that were necessary. There was only one layer of metal, so it was a lot easier back then, but it wasn't a huge complicated thing that you were doing. 1964 now is when I left school. Now I left school just to be really awkward. I left school without any qualifications because I was an academic failure. Um, I went to the secondary modern, which was uh, for people who were not very good at their exams. And, uh, and so that's what I did. And as soon as I possibly could, I left school. But I went and took an apprenticeship, and one of the things that it was a good company to go for, it was the government. Because what they were exposing me to was what state-of-the-art electronics was at that time. And I was, re I was responsible with my supervisor for measuring all sorts of stuff, speed of bullets, spin of bullets, and things of that nature. Keeping electronic equipment working, so I had to keep stuff like this working. And also, we didn't call it design, we called it development developing anything new that was needed because sometimes it was jolly awkward to measure things that needed to be measured. We didn't have a design group. We designed things with the development kit. But just to say, this is really what state-of-the-art looked like in a very professional electronic community at that time. <clears throat> Fifteen valves in a communication receiver. Technical excellence, and if you buy these things today and you can still buy them, on uh, eBay and the like, their performance is, is un unachievable in any other way because the signal-to-noise ratio achievable from valve amplifiers is still better than anything else. 
But it was interesting, a couple of years into my apprenticeship, we started to see the emergence of transistors. So this was a, again a state-of-the-art thing, it was a six-decade counter, all it did was time, it timed intervals. Uh, maximum speed was one megahertz, which doesn't sound very impressive. It wasn't very impressive. The first versions of which, and if you look here very carefully, you'll see there are six decade boards in it and they've got valves on it. A later version, they literally changed the valves for transistors. They didn't really know how to mount the transistors on the, on the printed circuit board or anything, so they literally soldered them on the back. Uh, so it was a, a highly sophisticated, uh, uh, that said ironically, manufacturing process, but it was the first introduction of transistors into state-of-the-art technical product. Now, the other thing that happened about that time is the transistor radio had been invented in 1955, but those double diffused transistors were jolly expensive, and it was the introduction of the integrated circuit technology, the planar technology, that brought the price of those way down, and so all of a sudden, by 1965, we all had our trannies. In those days, a tranny was a transistor radio. Okay, five to seven transistors. My friend had a five transistor radio, but I had a seven transistor radio, which made mine bigger and better. And it became the must have gadget. Everybody had their tranny. Valves, interestingly, had served electronics up to this point for 60 years. If we look how long the transistor has been around, since then, it's only 53 years. Transistor hasn't been around as long as valves have been in electronics, which is an interesting note. Bear in mind, this is still before I got my real hands on design. 1970, integrated circuits have moved on. Those simple 7.4 series devices with 80 odd components in them the, te the process technologies had started to shrink following Gordon Moore's prediction and all of a sudden it became possible to do things like this which was called in its time large-scale integration and it meant the production of stuff of that order of complexity on one piece of silicon to manufacture in this chip. This was actually a very breakthrough technology because it enabled this 4-bit ALU enabled a whole class of computers that had never previously been possible. It enabled uh, computers which could be put into businesses. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that was very neat about it was it was a bit slice construction which meant you could put several of them together on one printed circuit board or if you had a bigger a process which is capable of taking more components then you could put two of them together on the, on the integrated circuit and then four of them and then eight of them. So it was an architecture which was scalable, and that's great because scalable architectures is one of the fundamental strengths of digital design, and it wasn't something which we started with. <clears throat> this is the level of computer then that was possible using the 74 series uh, basic logic devices and the LSI devices, and don't forget this is all in TTL, which is bipolar, it's not CMOS. Uh, it enabled that class of computer to be created, and the first company that I went working for later on in, uh, when, I, when I did come out into uh, business had a computer of this nature. And you're looking at that machine giving around one MIP of performance, which was used by an entire site, and it was used on a batch process, which essentially means you wrote the program that you wanted to run, you submitted it, there were two runs a day, and the output came to you as uh, line printer output, line printer paper. So it may be a thick wadge of paper, which, uh, which, has, which was the uh, logical output of the simulation that you wanted to, to conduct. And actually, much of the early work for computers, these computers, were in the accounts departments, because they have a naturally numerate product, whereas design was dealing with predominantly analog things at the time, transistors. And the complicated, it was, became very complicated to do any kind of simulations and the first digital simulations weren't really around. So much, most of these things were designed essentially by seat of the pants. 
by 1971, Intel had made the Ford 004, which was really the first integrated processor chip. Two and a half thousand transistors possible now on a single piece of silicon. It's become a computer. If you look at that architecture, you can see there's a computer in it. It was designed, however, for a product. It wasn't designed for a computer. It was designed for a calculator. That's a four-function calculator. It has a printer, which is useful, and it's an accounts department that wanted it. They wanted it for summing up the, uh, the sales that were, were bought, and they sold an awful lot. It's called Busycom. It was what it was designed for. It was actually marketed as Unicom, but it's the same thing. That 4004 was the first processor, and it was certainly the first processor that I, I got my hands on and tried to do other things with it. But people did other things with it around 1970 and 74. By 1974 then, to put some context, is where I really seriously became um, involved because although I say I left school without any qualifications, I ended up going back to university, going back to school and going into university late. And so anyway, by now, 1974, I popped out of the system as a budding Einstein, okay? I was a pretty smart guy. I had good good degree lots of confidence which meant that I anticipated going out there and telling people how to do a lot of things because I was fresh off the uh, off the cart I was ready to impress my new employer and actually I went out there and I realized how little I actually knew <clears throat> I worked for this company and they were trying to bring microelectronics into telecoms we'll come back to that in a couple of slides because to anticipate that there, there might actually be microelectronics which didn't have, sorry, telecoms which didn't have microelectronics, you've got to understand something about the era. 1974. I quickly learned how little I knew relative to the incumbent engineers. I was learning from them very much. Uh, I brought new ideas, but most of the time they were telling me how to do things, and most of the time I was very grateful for that because. I was still expected to deliver. That's the thing which I got fairly quickly. So what was electronics like at that time? Well, we had the transistor radio. TV was still hybrid valve and transistors, the transistors we used in the RF chain but nowhere else. <clears throat> All signal processing was real time. Uh, people had not got round to even thinking about digi digital signal processing. It was analog is the way that things go forward. You had basic four-function pocket calculators available. They were fairly expensive. They were pocketable, and that was because some of those transistor, uh, some of that logic devices, the 74 series and the 4004, had been translated now into CMOS, which is much lower power, and could be incorporated into a calculator. Um, alas, the early displays left a lot to be desired. HP 35, the first scientific programmable calculator had just been launched but most people didn't earn enough in a year to buy one uh, the only people I knew that had them were university lecturers who obviously found good um, funding from somewhere commercial electronics you could have had a pro you'd likely to have had a single computer in most bigger companies uh, you might if you're lucky have had uh, access to some of that computer's time if you were in design Networking was primitive, local and very slow. There was nothing like the internet. Other things, diaries, address books, magazines, writing was biro on paper. You know, a lot of this stuff is still kind of there, but you know that an awful lot of it's been replaced by your computer and what you, what you can do on your desktop. Cars and telephones were electromagnetic. And this is a phone. 1974. This became one of my jobs. That was the phone. It had been designed in about 1950. It was in manufacture from 1964 to 84. So it was in manufacture for 20 years, that product. And they made it just like that, by connecting wires, crimping wires, screwing wires under terminals. That's its block diagram. There are four blocks, the speech block, the dialing block, the status block, which is the handset, and the ringer. You could have a phone today which has got the same block diagram, 
that just that if you look at those circuits, and that is the complete circuit, there's not a single transistor in there. It's all electromechanical and it's uh, uh, magnetic. <coughs> there's some very ingenious circuitry there. It don't, doesn't look very complicated, but this hybrid is a very work, works very well. It's a magnetic component for separating the uh, the 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 voice energy from the microphone from the earphone energy. You don't want to waste any power and that magnetic solution is very neat. I was interested in this. That's the dialer. This is a pulse dialer. It gives one pulse when you dial one. It gives ten pulses when you dial zero or nine pulses when you, design, when you dial nine. And this is a little bit of clockwork, really. There's a spring, there's this pulsing mechanism, there's a series of contacts. <clears throat> and my company said it would be really great if we could replace that with something electronic, which looked a little bit fancier. Um, <clears throat> and the way, and what they wanted to do was to replace it with that, a push-button dialer. And my first chip design was that, 1974, using a logic technique which you won't know anything about. I guarantee it. Go on, on uh, Wikipedia and you'll find it. It's interesting. It was a way of making very low power logic design because most of the <coughs> most of the logic at that time had been class A logic and this became a class D logic and that's another challenge for you to work out the difference between class A and class D. Uh, anyway 250 gates one killer transistor on 350 mil die nine square millimeter at that time is about you know it wasn't that difficult no logic design tools to assist us me to do the chip design and the printed circuit board design and any external electronic design and I had a guy working for me who was doing the plastic mouldings. We literally made everything in that including submitting it for approval <clears throat> and it was a big success. We made millions of them but only millions not billions. Now I'll start to use this diagram in a few places. Um, it's Moore's Law from the International Techno Technology Roadmap for Silicon in 1999 and I use it because it sits nicely in the middle of my life really. I can take it downward back to 1975 which is about where I hit the road running, 1000 transistor chip and later on I'll take it upward. But the thing I wanted to point out at this point was it was the 10,000 transistor that enabled the personal computer. So a 10,000 transistor chip, all of a sudden it became viable to design something like a personal computer. Now, at that point, think how much the, even at that point, think how much the design challenge has changed even for me. I was only designing 350 transistor uh, integrated circuits, 350 gate integrated circuits. <coughs> I didn't have to think too much about the, the method for simulation or design. I just used analysis, visual analysis. But by the time you're thought, talking about making a computer, you have to start to think about things like operating systems. And where are the applications that are going to run on it going to come from? Because they're all part of the design challenge. It steamed on. We saw the first Mac at around, I don't know, 25,000 transistors per chip. And the Acorn chip, which was the Archimedes, which I'll come back to, happened at about 200,000 transistors. Now this is a lot of change. The very first IBM PC, there was discussions about whether 640K of memory was, was going to be more than was ever needed. 640K of memory? It's not a big number. Anyway, this is the Archimedes chip. It was the ARM 32-bit risk processor, the so-called ARM1. I just wanted to put this up primarily because this is ARM and it sits very much in the, in the, hist uh, in the bit that follows next. But it also has a 4-bit uh, ALU in it. So this is pretty well that ALU that I was talking about not so long ago as a LSI device. So that's 4 bits of ALU, that's a 32-bit ALU. That's a chip full. Now, that chip full, of course, this is not many years later. This is the, an, an illustration of Moore's law in, ha, in, uh, in action, because all of this other stuff now has to be designed. 
which means you need much, much um, more capable methods. Methods was never an issue. You just designed it. But methods have, to have become an issue when you design something like this. How do you know you've got all the transistors connected to the right places, doing the right thing? How do you simulate something like this? How do you know what waveforms to put in to get the waveforms out? We were doing model-based design at this time, but we weren't using model-based verification. There was nothing outside the chip. You designed the chip, and you looked at the pins to see what the waveforms did. But nothing in verification. <coughs> there was no test suites. <coughs> it was on the edge of not being necessary. So back to this diagram. We move on a little bit, and we, we encounter the million transistors per integrated circuit of ARM. Here again we see another change. This now started to bring into being the concept of system design because now the integrated circuit had got so complicated that you couldn't do all of the work in one design team. This is what ARM actually brought to the, uh, to the market at that point, was a solution for a processor. So the people who were designing the chip didn't need to think about that. The processor brought with it all of the operating system and the programming environment and the stacks that were necessary for that time so that the people who were designing the rest of the chip didn't need to think about that. The design methodology has changed quite a lot by that. Not surprisingly then, just a few years later, we see that that whole ARM processor core, that we previously was a whole chip, has become a small part of a chip. This is still 1991, so this is the time when ARM was launched. But it had already become possible to include all of those peripherals that previously had to be external chips. So the memory management, the uh, uh, interrupt controllers, the um, serial ports and parallel ports, DMA. All of those were essential parts which were necessary when ARM was a chip on its own have just dropped into the silicon as well. But it also means that the design of this has become much more complicated. More complicated again. <clears throat> now, to put some sort of scale on it, I take my favorite diagram and I'll move it out to indicate a little bit closer to reality. And I'll show that by 2012, we were looking at uh, 20 billion transistors on an integrated circuit. 20 billion, it's a good number, isn't it? I wonder how many people have really got an idea about what it means. What it actually means, though, is that since ARM was founded, you could get 200,000 times more transistors on that chip than you had been when ARM was founded. So <clears throat> the methodology that ARM was using had to change. It couldn't do the same thing, even though it was just a case of saying, well, it's actually a block of IP which you can drop into your chip. How do you drop it into your chip? How do you design a system which is going to incorporate that and make it work? Because these chips, incidentally, are all getting frightfully expensive. You can't afford for them to be wrong anymore. They have to be right first time. <clears throat> so 20,000 in numbers of transistors plus 10 times the number of frequency. So I misled you a little bit. It's 200,000 times overall. Um, but let's look at what it means. So by 2012, we were looking at a billion transistors in production. This is an NVIDIA die shot that I was able to get. One billion transistors on 45 nanometers. You can see that there is at least six, seven cores. As those, those are the four cores. That's a management processor. Then you've got an ARM7 there and a GPU. We're looking at seven or so processor cores back in, in 2012 currently running at maximum of about 60 processor cores. This is scary stuff. Not only scary stuff, but you've got to know how to design it. Way, way, way down inside your billion transistor chip, you've actually got transistors. They're real individual things. They're still there. That's just three of them. Look at the metalwork here you realize it's not just a case of putting three transistors down, it's a case of connecting them up to do something useful. And the connecting is a major problem. But actually, 10 layers of metal gives you a lot more functionality. You can connect those things together in ingenious ways. 
So the, if you combine that with the 200,000 times basic increase in capacity, then you're talking of closer to 2 million times of, uh, of additional complexity between when ARM was founded and today, 1991 and today. <clears throat> now people have got this idea that process development is very, is very singular, that processes just developed. Well, you need improved transistors and process architectures. Look, here's a, a, a planar transistor, somewhat classic. People are doing FinFET these days. The architecture is not the same. The way you design with them is not the same. The transistor characteristics are very different. Tra transistors, when you're, dri when you're driving them with very low voltage, are in a different operating mode. They're actually quite, more, quite a bit more difficult to use. It's very difficult to close the loop and incorporate um, real capacitances in the circuit and work out whether all of the nodes in the circuit are, uh, are, are adequately buffered. <clears throat> You've got photolithography. The amount of money that's been poured into this EUV stepper in, uh, in, um, in Holland, I can't remember the company, ASML, it says on the side. And they still haven't got it right. They've been working on this for, I guess, 10 years. It's fundamentally necessary to go to the next levels of process. But this is not part of the fab industry. It's part of the of a specific fab company. It's part of the fab industry. People are working in all sorts of different areas throughout this process to inch the processes forward to keep up with the predictions that Moore's Law were, was anticipating. It's a whole lot of things, but a die full of transistors is not a product. 20 billion transistors on an integrated circuit is not a product. It's just 20 billion transistors. I can have a glass full of water, it's got billions and billions of molecules in it, but it's not doing anything, and without it being connected together, without the configuration being designed, then it's, uh, it's not a product, it's not capable of helping a product. And the design process has also become exponentially more complex. So don't forget, this is what I'm trying to say, all of these changes are happening all of the time, and for me to have remained valuable inside a company which is working at the front end of this, I've had to know about these changes. Now, did they teach me that in university? I'll let you ponder that for a moment. Now, the other thing that, uh, was, which is why I like this gap, this uh, diagram, is the productivity gap. It's the only time that ITRS put this on the, on the table, and that was a showing of just how much effort it was going to take to make chips in the future. So 1991, 1999 was when they did it here. They had some idea of points along this red curve, but all they could say was they could see that productivity was going to be a major problem. Its design complexity was going to be a major problem. They didn't get it entirely right because they totally forgot about verification at that point. It hadn't really started to appear. Verification gap was a major, major problem. Um, now, these are things which essentially IP, the, the, the idea of IP, blocks that other people have put together, blocks that other people have proven, dropping them in and using them became so valuable because it meant that the productivity could be pushed up by reuse. That's not a clean sheet design anymore, that's reuse and it's incorporating stuff that other people have done because you can't afford to design every last transistor individually anymore. So the single designer, and that was me in the first place doing that chip as part of my, of my small project, became a small team, became a local team, became a global team. Fortunately things like the internet enabled the idea of global teams but that's where we're now working. The clean sheet design became some reuse, became hardware and software reuse, became expertise reuse. You can't design a chip today without knowing what G5 uh, mobile phone uh, methods mean. You need to know this stuff. You need to know how to compress and decompress video. You need to at least have some idea about the technologies associated with Wi-Fi. You're designing a chip which needs all of those inputs. You can't design the chip on its own. You can't design the hardware on its own. You can't design the software on its own. These are complex things, and they have had to change during my lifetime. 
without greater than 90% reuse today, none of the smart electronic products that you've got around you would be possible. They would be unproducible. They wouldn't be possible to even design. So these are fundamental techniques which have had to be incorporated, which have had to be created. So the academic community hasn't been sitting idle on the, in, in this time. It's been thinking about how these things are going to be implemented. They've been part of the solutions, the solutions which had to then be incorporated into industry when it came to making a product. So again, for some scale, we're now going to talk systems. This is Canon's 1998 pretty good what they call prosumer can, um, camera. It's not professional, neither is it consumer. It's professional pro-consumer. It needed to have a good mechanism. It's a good mechanism for enhancing memory. It needed to have good lenses, fine mechanical systems, electromagnetic mechanical exposure, metalwork and some plastic forming, though not really very sophisticated. Nevertheless, it was much better than carved out of wood. Um, manual assembly and a 2D photochemical memory. Don't like to think about that. Lenses incidentally do an amazing thing of transfer transferring 3D reality to 2D planes. You don't even notice that they're there, but that's what they're doing. And then a, a, a film was a 2D memory, a marvelous simple mechanism for converting that 3D world into a memory which is at least more permanent. Now you see the architecture of a camera down there. Well, fundamentally it didn't change. And by, 20, by 2005 we're looking at uh, the Canon EOS 5D which was broad, broadly the same product. Um, <clears throat> it still needed to have excellent lenses and precision forming and plastic and metal but it also had all of this stuff analog sensors, precision mechanics, micro motors, batteries, displays, um, electronic packaging technology for how you put the uh, electronic circuits into this lot and make it something which is producible. The other thing is it's quite noticeable those top three pieces of electronics constitute a computer so it's not just a uh, capable of triggering a shutter or adjusting an aperture. It's cap capable of doing stuff with the picture, reformatting, adjusting the exposure quite sophisticatedly, making decisions to help the photographer. Also, the integrated manufacture. Manufacture has become part of the design. We can't, you couldn't make this camera by hand. The micro motors in it need to be assembled by machine because they're too small. They only have an adequate yield because they're automated. And it's not just that is the only part of this process. The electronic packaging has to be automated. It can't be done by hand. These methods then have extended from the design of the chip through the design of the software into the design of the system. This camera is not judged by how clever the electronics is. It's judged by how well it takes pictures. It's a functional product. If it doesn't take pictures, it doesn't work irrespective of whether your part, the electronics part of it, if you want to interpret it in that way, did or didn't. The camera doesn't take pictures, it doesn't work. <clears throat> Still the same architecture. Implementation changes with technology. <clears throat> and it's a system design. I want to emphasize this because we're definitely into the system design world. What you're designing when you go out there will be systems. You won't be designing them on your own. You won't be doing a single man product unless you're a very working for a very small SME. That's not the era. The era we are in is the era of teams and the teams are designing a system. I don't know what happens after system but the world hasn't slowed down. It's still blasting forward at this incredible pace. So ARM's relatively simple model of a little bit of uh, electronics which will pass to other people has become this hugely complex model. It's the tip of an iceberg. It still seems to be the same thing on the outside, but it's actually much deeper than that. All of those names at the back are ARM's partners. Those are the people who take ARM's technology and embed it in products which are interesting to them. 
they, ARM gets feedback from every one of them to help to improve their product for their next and subsequent generations. And they have to learn. ARM has to learn. It's not just about produ producing a CPU. It's about producing a CPU which will fit into the system. And the system will work better if you use an ARM CPU and the, and the ARM peripherals and the ARM software and the ARM design environments and so on than it will work if those other people choose to try and do it a different way. It's a, it's a suitability for purpose, but it has meant that ARM has this wide range of different tools, including software environments which will enable people to, to simulate the entire products that they're going to make before they're created. That's very important because the costs of doing the actual implementations are so high, the timescales are so long, that it can't afford to get it wrong anymore. And although ARM tends to be known as maybe the, the company that provides the processor which sits inside the, the main CPU, it sits in the middle, in point of fact, it's not wrong to say that, but in point of fact, it's also involved in pretty well every other chip that's in there as well. Because all of the chips are smart these days. They all need to be adaptive. They all need to, to recognize the environments in which they're working and make decisions. So ARM is present as an IP block in, the, in uh, the, pretty well the entire range of the 20 odd chips that you find inside a smartphone. ARM isn't the only people who are providing IP. You go on to the DNR uh, design and reuse website and you'll find quite a lot of people there selling IP products. Um, IP is coming in from all, over the, from all over the world. ARM doesn't know about Wi-Fi, for example, but it does know about the processor, which might be useful with it. But who are the people like Apple who are designing their control chip, which has got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and so on, has, needs a processor, but they also need access to that other knowledge as well. So what is driving technology today? Well, it's tempting to believe that this is a modern, uh, I think it says blue gene on the side, it does, modern high performance HPC machine. Surely this is still the thing which is driving technology forward. Our technology, this must be stretching all of the envelopes that are, that are possibly in need of stretching. Look at those weather, military, financial, um, professional electronic simulation. You know, these, this is surely going to be at where it's at. But the answer is no, it's not. The thing that's driving technology today is the consumer. It's these guys. This is where the volume is. Arm shipped through its partnership last year about 20 billion CPUs. 20 billion last year. There's only how many people in the world? 8 billion? That's last year. It did 25% less than that the previous year and 25% less than that the previous year, which also means if you extrapolate the line forward rather than backwards, then the numbers are going up, as far as we can see, around 25% per year. This is colossal numbers. Those people are designing chips which go into all of this kind of product and many, many more. But the people who are buying these products don't even know that there's an ARM chip in there. They don't know which part of it is done in hardware, which part of it is done in software. They don't know from the camera point of view how important the lens is because people take pictures with their smartphone, they take it with a camera. You know, people buy them as different, but they don't under a lot of people don't understand why. The technology is invisible. So the disturbing point about this is what you're planning to make a career out of the consumer who's going to buy it knows nothing about it and frankly isn't interested either. So you've got, to, you've got to make sure that whatever you're designing, whatever you're producing has got to have the consumer in mind because they're the people who ultimately pay for it and it's only when they buy it off the shelf that the money flows back down the food chain, which includes the research community. So this is what we were looking at when that first, those first mainframes came up. A bit of a bulge. There was nothing else above it. They haven't gone away. They're still there. People still need mainframes. And they still required um, high performance. And the performance is still required to go up. But essentially, it was the mini computer, then the personal computer, the desktop, mobile internet, and holy of holies, the, the internet of things, today's 
uh, wonder market opportunity. Each one of these is roughly 10x bigger than, the, than its predecessor. And each one of those is a market opportunity. Let's look at it another way. It's a way of taking money from people who've got it to spend, which in general is everybody in the world. The disturbing thing is that as you move up these, the other, the other levels still exist. They're still being redesigned. They're still being worked on. They're still being needed. But as, the, as we move up here, the needs of the professional are not being dominate, not being dominant anymore. It's the needs of the consumer which dominate where the technology goes. And they are the ones which essentially satisfying them are the ones that, where your career will be. <coughs> So, a product is a commercial opportunity. Right. You have to remember that it's got to work is its prime purpose. You get no reward whatsoever if it doesn't work. It's also got to do some other things. It's got to be available. So it's got to go there. It's got to be available when the market window is open. It's got to be economical. It's got to cost less to make than you can sell it for. Um, it's got to be manufacturable. It doesn't matter how exotic the thing is, if you can't make it in enough volumes to satisfy the customer, it's a failure. It's got to be reliable enough. If there's too many returns, then you spend too much effort mending things. That, uh, that is also, uh, people will go to other, other suppliers. If your product isn't as reliable as something from somebody else, then uh, they go to somebody else. And it's got to be innovative. It's fine to put together something that works, but unless it's got some sort of extra bells and whistles that the consumer appreciates, then they're not going to buy it. Now, I want to put the challenge, because this is the real game of being an electronic engineer, design engineer, or a scientist. It's delivering an accurate prediction of the future. I don't know really any other business which is expected to predict the future with something like 99% probability of it being right. You know, the economics uh, community are famously bad at this. Um, other people, you know, bakers have to predict what the volume of dough is that they're going to need next day. And sometimes it can be so far wrong that you might run out of bread before you've sold an appropriate number of loaves. But the stuff that we're doing is predicting the future. This is serious business. It's a crystal ball. Certainty, timescales, cost, quality, utilizing the technologies which are available. An engineer can't just do things because it seems like a good idea. Has to do it because it's going to work. And the introduction of things which are um, which are just fanciful, or technologies which seem like they're exciting or, or, success, or sexy, are not appropriate. Businesses haven't got time for that. And the reward that you get for delivering something that works is you get to keep your job. That's a hard world out there. You don't get extra thanks for doing what you're supposed to do. You only get extra thanks for doing more than you're supposed to do. So a career, my career, take, take me from that to that. Did my degree prepare me for all this change? Actually, my degree looks very similar to the subject list on yours. The real thing that my degree taught me was the language to allow me to go into rooms with people who were facing these problems, to listen to what they were saying and to have some idea of what they were talking about, and to contribute a little bit towards the solution, because these solutions are team activities, not individual activities. It gave me some hands-on experience. And the primary thing is it taught me to think for myself because I was going to have to learn continually and that was always going to be my job to do. So the answer is, surprisingly, yes, it was good. But to stay valuable then, it means staying in that room. The room could be a room, it could be a meeting room, can be the group that you're working with, but anywhere where decisions are made, your job, your strategy, is be in that room. You can't be involved in the decisions unless you're in that room. You will not be invited into that room unless you are a contributor. You will not be able to contribute unless you've got some idea about the technologies which are emerging. But also because those technologies are emerging, nobody expects you to know all the answers. 
And that's a big thing for you to overcome. There is a great tendency for people, I was one of those people, to sit quietly because I didn't feel confident in my answer. Say it. The other people in the room are not confident either. And they will listen to what you say and they'll say, you know, that's the basis of a good idea. We'll need to modify it and change it. Don't forget, you're part of a team. And a team is delivering, not you. <clears throat> so conclusions then. I believe your working life will see just as much change as mine did. Think about that one, please, because there's a lot of change there. I hope I've showed you how much change, how much I've had to change. You will see as much. I don't know what it's going to be any more than my professors knew what the electronics thing was going to be over the next 45 years. I don't know what yours is going to be, but it will change. It's not slowing down. It's speeding up, if anything. Your degrees only give you the language and the basic skills. Don't feel less confident by that. Be bullish about what you know, but at the same time recognize that when you go out there, you're going to be a junior. You're going to be a graduate engineer. And if you're lucky, if you work hard, stay in the room, do get involved, listen to people who've got things to say, then you'll stay in the room. People will keep inviting you back. Your degree gets you into those first rooms. It's up to you to keep yourself there. And I think I've already said that. Don't be afraid, and this is a very serious one, to ask, why are we in this meeting? I have been to so many meetings where people don't know what they're expecting to come out of the meeting. That's a very good question. And you can almost guarantee that if nobody else has asked it, then that's one for you to ask. At which point, I'll say thank you for listening, and I hope you found something valuable in it. That's all right. I'm sorry, I.